Welcome to the Evolved Caveman, where men learn to be successful and happy with your host, Dr. John Schinnerer, as he shares the most impactful ideas and practices for you to get the most from your relationships, your work, and from your life. Now here's Dr. John. Hey, all you Evolved Cavemen and cave women out there. This is Dr. John with the Evolved Caveman podcast. And if you like some of the stuff that you've heard out there, be sure to check out my individual coaching packages at guidetoself.com. You can find out more at the evolvedcaveman.com. And be sure to check out the Ultimate Couples Retreat, which is a week-long, idyllic, adventure and journey into learning more about yourself and your partner and ways to reconnect in Costa Rica, September, 2020. You can find out more at the ultimate relationship.com. <laughs> hey everybody. And welcome back to the latest episode of the evolved caveman. And I am thrilled to have with me here, Dr. Lindsay Wisner. And Lindsay is a clinical psychologist in Long Island, New York. So you know she's pulling down the big bucks. She graduated from Georgetown University in 1999 and was awarded a fellowship in child development at the NIH NICHD, which is quite, a, quite an accomplishment. She received her doctorate from CW Post LIU and went on to pursue post-doctorate training at the American Institute of Psychoanalysis. We won't hold that against her, though. <laughs> Dr. Weisner is the current host of the Neurotic Nourishment podcast and the co-author of the upcoming book, 10 Steps to Finding Happy. And this book's going to be re released on March 20th yes, in sir. accordance with the UN's International Day of Happiness. So we'll have information on where you can find the book and where you can find her at the end of the show and in the show notes. And Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on. How are you doing? I am good. Thank you. I feel like we've been hanging a lot lately. We have. We mm -hmm. did a, an interview for your podcast and now we're doing this one. Yes, and I'm very excited because who doesn't like talking about sex? And well, and I'm so glad that the guy the last time we tried to set this up, the first time, there was a locksmith working downstairs. <laughs> it just put my mood into the trash can because yeah, anyway, we won't go there. Um but so, now we're better, so <laughs> yes, much better day. So <laughs> today we were going to talk about the hedonic treadmill specifically with regarding sex, which I think is just, you know, always a good topic, as you said. But for those of you who don't know, I've, I've talked a few times about the hedonic treadmill. I think it's one of the biggest barriers to happiness that we humans have. And the hedonic treadmill is this phenomenon whereby we adapt to anything good or bad. You can adapt to being in a concentration camp or to losing the use of your legs in an, after an auto accident, or you can adapt to winning the lottery or being married to someone, really, you, hate. Who? someone you hate or no, someone no, 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 supermodel, you can adapt to that too, because, you know, eventually you're going to see her on the toilet and then everything kind of goes out the window. And Lindsay's looking at me very confused. I don't think we should see our spouses on the toilet. But I agree. I, I agree. I don't, that's a hedonic treadmill I don't want to get used to. But no. anyway, so, so let's go into the hedonic treadmill of sex. The idea that we adapt to even sex with someone that we love, and then it might get mundane, run-of-the-mill, even boring. Well, wait, can I ask, where did the hedonic treadmill, um, where does that hedonic come from, that word, do you know? Hedonic is, uh, is pleasure, basically. Hedonism, if you live a life of hedonism, then you are solely living for pleasure, for sensory pleasure. Okay, so sensory pleasure becomes routine, like a rat in a cage, or... Yeah, you habituate to it. You just get used to it. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, I want to argue with you and it's so early on. <laughs> it is. You can't argue until five minutes in. Okay. So yes, I am on full agreement of this hedonic treadmill, <laughs> which is unique. Um, but I do think that if we look at the hedonic treadmill as both related to pleasure and pain, it also explains why um, I work a lot with teens, particularly suicidal teens or depressed teens or anxious teens. And I do think that our, that's the psychoanalytic in me, I do think that our upbringing um, 
has a huge part in who we turn out to be and what we turn out to expect from relationships. And so I think to some extent, whatever we see gets ingrained with us, in us subconsciously as being like the norm. So similarly, if your dad beats you regularly, a part of you thinks this is normal, at least until you um, grow up and realize that other people's dads don't do quite the same thing. So what if you see your parents having sex? I have seen my parents having sex. <laughs> I have seen my parents in various sexual positions. Wow. And, and how has that worked out for you as an adult in a relationship? Well, I became a shrink. <laughs> <laughs> Still recovering. Still recovering, but also my, um, we have had to explain to my mom that she has to wear pants when she visits. <laughs> <laughs> that does like explain that. a lot. Is she like, was she part of the nudist movement or? Um, I don't know, but pretty much most of my friends have seen her naked or semi-naked at some point. Interesting. And, um, my husband, thank God they don't listen to podcasts, but, um, the week of my uh, my husband's mother died unexpectedly in the week of her shiva. He went home to put our young children to bed and found her naked standing in our kitchen. Um, and so on the upside, it was a laugh and a break from the morning of his mother. And on the downside, it scarred him too. So there Yeah, you. once that bell is rung. Can't unring it. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. No. Did you ever see your parents having sex? No, I'm not sure they, well, they had it once because. Are you an only child? I have an older sister. She's a year and a half older. She was adopted because um, my mom actually experienced uh, several miscarriages and didn't think they could have kids. And then she got the stress taken off of her and she had a kid. Yeah. So many ways I'm the miracle child. Mm, That remains to be seen. Well, that's how (laughs) I like to think of it. (laughs) That's true. But I guess the point is. It's interesting because, uh, so it must, I wonder if in the course of trying to conceive and disappointment and fail, you know, miscarriages, um, sex became like a hedonic treadmill. And then once the pressure was released, your parents were able to happily engage in yeah. sex and produce you. Well, and you've seen that. I mean, I've seen that in couples where I have really trying to have a child and sex becomes burdensome. Sex becomes a have to rather than a get to. Um, and it's there's so much stress involved in the sex act itself. It makes me wonder, wow, how much of that cortisol is really affecting the pregnancy itself or the, the ability to get pregnant? A lot. I mean, I think we've proven that, haven't yeah. we? I think, I think so. Really, I haven't really yeah. read up on the research there, but. You can't cite it, but I will, I will back you on this one. Yeah. Um, no, it's true. And I also know, um, just uh, anecdotally, I have a lot of, not a lot of, but a, 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 enough friends that are adopted that also have um, bio, what would we call it? I have enough friends who are adopted, and then shortly thereafter, their parents were able to conceive biologically. Really? Mm-hmm. I've got like four or five. Wow. I know. Um, but yeah, it makes the pattern makes sense that the stress goes away because you have a child now and then you can relax. Right. And then you're having sex thinking, well, I can't get pregnant. And then, you know, yeah, may as well just enjoy it, which is nice. And it, which turns off the hedonic, hedonic treadmill. Yeah. Well, it makes me think, you know, I've been talking with a lot of sex experts lately, and they say that, you know, the woman needs to relax in order to have a chance of orgasm, which is all about the parasympathetic nervous system. And it, it makes me think of how many of us men do not excel or do well at screwing up our partner's feeling of safety and security and how much that impacts their, their sex, their ability to have pleasure, their ability to have an orgasm. This is true. I mean, I think we're t- there's obviously a wide range of um, fucking up that safety quotient, you know, physical, emotional, um, Certainly there are times when a couple go through a rough relationship and you you don't want to misstep, you know, um, or it feels frightening for either the woman or the man. I will also say that I have seen couples save their marriage by having sex. Mm-hmm. Like by basically, if you can't connect emotionally or intellectually while you're going through a difficult time, sex has been a connecting force. And I kind of credit sex for saving several marriages. Mm-hmm. Well, I think to me, it's a, it's a huge act of vulnerability. And I think the best sex has an emotional connection component to it prior to the physical act. 
Agreed. But if your emotional connection is struggling, at least that, I kind of look at it as a Pavlovian thing. You know, like my only argument against open marriages is I don't like, I want to look across the room and have some sort of subconscious, um, you know, bell ringing. Should I explain the Pavlov thing or we got it? Uh, you can, yeah, go ahead and explain it briefly. So Pavlov was this weird scientist. He was Russian, um, which is not why he was weird, but he <laughs> had have contributed, but he decided he wanted to know how much saliva dogs produced. Um, it just sounds super disgusting. It was like he was collecting buckets of saliva. Why? I have no <laughs> idea. But in the course of this, in order to measure, you know, to time it from beginning to end, he would um, ring a bell and the like the assistants would all get come out at the same time and they would all deliver food to the dogs where then this oh, i want to vomit every time i tell the story <laughs> where then the saliva was collected and so then he measured the saliva but in the course of this experiment as in most great discoveries in life he realized that the dogs started to salivate before the food got there at first the dogs started to salivate at the bell. And then when he changed things up, he realized that the dogs were also salivating at the white coats that all the assistants were wearing. So the point is, this is classical training. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's been a while. Um, um, it's behaviorism, which I'm not a big fine. fan of, but yeah. Mm, still, I don't know what I'm a big fan of anymore. I'm a big fan of anything that feels right and sounds yeah. valid. Um, but so, you know, he, essentially these dogs were reacting to the food they were wanting the food, desiring the food, and producing physical reactions to desire, uh, which we can kind of relate to, like, um, I don't know how deep I want to get into this, but which we can, I don't know how specific, we can relate that to the physical changes that a man and woman experience when they yeah. are anticipating, um, you know, sexual. Well, just having the thought about sex can arouse us. Right. And so, and also here were these dogs sort of reacting to um, the promise of impending sex. And they were trained to then, they saw a white coat and they salivated. They got, the, the dogs were actually looking for food. I don't know about sex as well, but you know. But my point is, as humans, <laughs> I want my partner and I to be trained to only salivate, so, so to speak, at each other. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that's not human, though. Oh, no, no, no. I don't care if you're. Um, attracted to another person. Okay. Great. Good for you. But to me, there's something about the idea that the only person, the only person notice I made the distinction that can, that, that I receive orgasm from is, um, you know, my husband. I'm not discounting sex toys in the uh, That's what I was going to say. So toys are not excluded. Toys from are not people. That's why I said it like that. I, but so, um, to me, like that would be the opposite of your hedonic treadmill is, uh, being aroused by the thought, the anticipation of climax. Well, and don't you also know couples that have been together 10, 15, 20 years where the thought of having sex with the partner doesn't arouse? It's probably lousy sex. That you, you know, Well, yeah, I think that's part of it. It's, it's routine. It's, you know, oh, we're going to have sex. It's Friday night. Okay, 9 o'clock. Here we go. Yes. Um, Missionary yes, I style. do. Right. Yes, I do. But also I think that I feel like if you've, if I feel like there's probably something else going on besides just the routine. Cause if the routine is I get three orgasms every time I have sex, I still want to have sex. If that's the routine. I mean, right. I, I've seen a lot of, I've talked to a lot of women who are reluctant to even kiss or hug their husband because they don't want to have sex and they feel like if they initiate touch that it's going to send an expectation to their husband and their husband's gonna be like all right i'm gonna get lucky tonight and they don't I even know. want to go down that road and i think that's very um sad and telling and it's probably about more than just sex it's probably about definitely uh, you know a, a physical connection i had a patient I am going to break HIPAA, but not really, so don't worry. Um, I had a patient that I started seeing right before she um, she got engaged, or maybe right before she got engaged, and she already had suspicions about her husband and his, her husband-to-be and his fidelity, and uh, there was just something off, and also their sex life wasn't great, and he didn't make her feel attractive or anything. We 
honestly, I, so she, they just had to get married in a church. And so for religious reasons, I had to talk to the deacon. It's probably not called a deacon, but it doesn't matter. Um, a thing. I had to talk to the thing, the priest, the deacon, the, the religious person and say, well, you're Jewish. Do you know these things? Are you Jewish? Me? No, I'm just engaged to someone who's Jewish. I'm learning. That doesn't explain your ridiculously Jewish last name. I'm German. Oh, uh, okay. In, uh, uh. Fine. I've got Weisner, Weisner, so yeah. we'll, we'll be in agreement. Um, so uh, good for you. Now you'll be tortured by both sets of guilt. Yes. So, uh, you know, I had to talk to the, I want to say deacon, whatever it was, and tell him that I felt that they were a good fit to be married. Like mm-hmm. I had to give my like non, my Jew blessing, I guess. Were they? A therapist. No. And so I did not tell him that they were. I told him that um, she probably has a large, she is very organized and put together and structured and he is less so. And she probably has a larger savings account than I do, despite the fact that we're 20 years apart. Mm-hmm. And I, it is my hope that they will be a good, you know, counter influences on each other, that he will allow her to live life in a more full and fun way and that she will um i don't know what else i said because this was literally eight years ago and guess what <laughs> what they're not together now Shocker. i know um but right before i mean the right like the relationship continued to deteriorate there were many suspicious things on his part and then right before, and then the sex stopped and she sent me a TED talk about um, sexless marriages and how mm. they were fairly common and they did not write. And they, um, it was kind of like a pro sexless marriage. Like, don't worry, this happens. And I, I heard it. It sounded brilliant. I really enjoyed listening to it. And all I could think was, ah, oh, No. Yeah. I mean, to me, sex is a really important part of a good relationship. And, you know, I mean, to go back to your point earlier, I can see where if you're having some struggles with your spouse that one, because I I look at it as bi-directional, right? You have a good emotional connection that leads to good sex, or maybe you have good sex and that can jumpstart your emotional connection. Like I I could see it going either way. Um, But, uh, and I do see a lot of women in their forties and fifties that are like, yeah, I just, I'm not into sex. Like I don't, I don't want sex. I don't want my husband to touch me. And what's your response? Uh, I, that's a really good question. You know, basically what I just said that I think sex is a really important part of marriage. And I think that that's indicative of some or many other things going on. And that if you're made to feel attractive, adored, respected, loved, if that connection's there, then maybe sex might be a little bit more desirable. Well, I, you know, I've also had this conversation with my husband who hopefully is not listening because he, you know, um, but you know, I'm 42 years old and there are many things that were fantastic about hitting 40 that I never thought would be. Um, I kind of became more of a badass. I believe in myself. I don't, that's a lie. I try to judge myself less by the number on the scale and the wrinkles in the mirror and also Botox, thank God. But, um, but I also feel more confident in my intelligence and my wit and in things that weren't as important to me when I was younger and more focused on how I looked compared to how other people like how I looked in a short skirt versus how other people look. Right. Well, and I, I think the other thing that enters into it, and I'm not female, so I don't know, but I I guess I can comment and comment on it from my perspective that I think as we get older and our bodies start to look less than due to age, I I can see that that enters into it as well, where you're just not as comfortable perhaps being naked in front of your partner. I I mean, I remember I was talking to a kid who's in his early twenties and, you know, he had never had sex before and we were talking about this and, and it just made me realize like how vulnerable an act it is to strip naked in front of someone else. Right. But when it, listen to me, I was actually going somewhere different with this, but you are totally right. But for me, um, I don't actually care. 
I mean, I did admit that I put on makeup for male podcast hosts, but not still not hitting on you. But um, I don't actually care. The one person I really want to find me attractive is my husband. <laughs> and the one person who is less likely to compliment me on my appearance or any husband on, uh, with wife on their appearance is the husband because of, as you said it, this hedonic treadmill. You know, we now have a joke in my family where on the, you know, rare occasions, five, six times a year, my husband and I have a date night. We walk out and my son is quick to tell me how beautiful I look or my daughter is. And it's part, my son is a heart of gold and part they want to beat daddy to it because I've complained before that like, like I will put out, just tell me I'm pretty once in a while. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, we're looking for, as we get older, we do need more reassurance, mm-hmm. particularly women, men as well. But um, I think we're more, women are more comfortable with themselves, their sexuality, their intellect, their abilities. And yet the one thing that we want from our husbands and more so than anyone else is that reassurance that we're still hot, even yeah, though. That you're desired. Yeah, you're desirable. So, so let's let's talk about some of the um, some of the compliments that you would like to hear because I think a lot of men that I talk to get stuck on that because the men that I know that aren't very good at it I think um, aren't comfortable saying some of these words like "Hey, honey, your ass looks great in those jeans." And yeah, you're up on the ass. Okay, but let's say. Well, I guess you work a, a lot with like. Um, cavemen that you hope to evolve or cavemen that are evolved in certain ways and others evolving not. evolving no but you know i imagine from what we've spoken about you work with um intelligent successful men who are only their only weakness is in the uh relationship department relationships in general i would say okay Well, I, I was just differentiating between relationship <laughs> at home with your spouse versus relationships at work. Oh, that's a good point. Okay, that is important. Um, so I, you know, it depends who your spouse is. Like, my husband is never going to tell me that my ass looks great in, the, in, my, in jeans because I am the potty mouth of the family. Um, that is my job. But I think that you guys know when we make an extra effort, like if I'm not in pajamas and you come home, (laughs) you know, or if there's a special event or something, I don't know if the words matter, you know, for me, for my patients personally, you know, this patient I was telling you about, like we knew there was problems in the relationship where she started losing a ton of weight and was smoking hot and he still made her feel unattractive. Uh, and he, she wasn't unattractive before she lost weight, but she gained the confidence to really start asking questions and to get off of her hedonic, you know, treadmill of, I'm not going to get what I need sexually. Hmm. Yeah. And I've seen that before where husbands are like, well, I would compliment her if she just lost 25 pounds. So you know, that kind of thing. Husband, and have you punched them in the face? Yeah. Because it, to me, it's a, it's a chicken or egg thing. And it's like, okay, what do you control? If you control the compliments, which might encourage her and motivate her to get going, maybe she would start working out or maybe she would start eating more healthy. Um, so it's kind of this, what comes first? And, you know, to me, it's, it's not so much about the body. It's about the feeling that you get from being with the person. I agree. I've also never seen... In my experience, I have never seen a woman lose weight and thus change the way her husband looks at her. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I think it's an excuse. Yeah, I mean, oh, actually, I did see the first Wives Club, and I love that movie, especially because they sing this great song at the end. <laughs> um, and I'm a huge fan of anything involving music. It usually either makes me want to scream and dance or, you know, cry. Um, but other than that one representation, I... I don't know. I don't think that that's how it works. I think that if you, like we marry men expecting them to um, lose their hair. Sorry, John. And how old were you when you? Uh, I would say probably late 30s. And my hair was thinning. So I just was like, oh, I think I'll buzz it and just see what it looks like. And then I was like, oh, it looks okay. And then you've got a good head. It's fine. I think I'll shave it and see how it looks. And I like it. So I kept it. 
Right. I mean, I think we marry men knowing that at some point they're probably not going to look like they did when we married them, unfortunately, yourself included. And I don't give a shit about your hair. Like, you men, oh, or maybe you Botox. But whatever it is, men age more gracefully than women unless we work our asses off. And it sucks. Um, My husband was a good-looking man when I met him. He's continues to be a great looking man. And so, um, it sucks. And also there's a thing where if men go on a diet, you guys can lose like, like, okay. Oh, I've been on a diet for two days. I've lost 80 pounds, you know, like, uh, Well, then I think there's some truth to those, those old sayings of, you know, when women get into a relationship, they think they can change their man. When men get into a relationship, they don't want the woman to change. That's interesting. I'm not really, I haven't really heard it before. Um, it makes sense. It's, an old, it's it. so old that I haven't heard it because you're so old. Let's oh, I'm very old. I know. Um, but I think that, I don't know if I entered into my relationship knowing, thinking he would change. I do know a lot of people that did. And um, I might have told you this when we recorded last. One of the greatest conversations I've ever had with my husband was on our 10 year anniversary where he told me that um, he really thought I was more submissive when he met me. And I was, right? <laughs> what exactly does that mean? Um, not in bed, more as in... General? Yeah, like I'm the person who raises my hand at the PTA meeting. I was like, we got to go down a different road or we're all going to look like assholes. You know, I'm the person who... Um, says it like it is and pisses people off and even in the therapy room like I'm gonna tell you the truth and you're gonna either be able to handle it or um or not I'm not but I think that's better in terms of being a therapist because I know a lot of therapists that can establish rapport very well but then don't do the hard work of challenging the client yeah they don't tell them straight up I had a great therapy moment today. I was seeing a very disturbed, uh, not disturbed, she wasn't disturbed, but she was uh, sexually abused and just starting to talk about it. She had borderline tendencies. I'm not sure I would classify her that way. Outpatient DBT may have been helpful. Mm -hmm. I saw her for about two years, and then I think her mom got frustrated that more progress wasn't being made, and I got frustrated that mom wasn't listening to my suggestion to start her own meds. And she reached out to me about an hour ago just to update me on how she was doing. And like, she's been up and down, but I love the fact that she reached out to tell me how she was doing and that she's decided to make a change for herself. And this will probably ebb and flow and go back and forth. But like, this is tough work we do. Mm -hmm. Um, And it can't be clear cut. You know, it just can't be. And so... I really think all of us are doing whatever we can to survive, whether that be denial, maintaining status quo, um, refusing the correct help. You know, we, we all have our coping skills, even if they suck. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. It's a, it's a tough job. I'm not sure why, well, I know why I signed up for it. Not sure why you did it though. I wanted to serve people. I wanted to help people. Oh, please. Yeah. You wanted to serve people? Mm-hmm. You could have been a waiter. That's not very challenging. But it was funny. <laughs> um, um, no, I think I wanted to find out the answers to some of the questions of my childhood and my yeah. future and my present. And uh, some of them I have found out. Most of them I will not. I'm Yo, you will probably fuck up your kids almost as badly as I am going to. Because Oh, guaranteed. Yeah, because my husband is a, as we discussed, he's a psychologist and a lawyer. So, and I know your fiance is a marriage therapist. Yep. So good luck with that. Yeah, and we both have podcasts. So now our girls can- Does she have a podcast? Uh Uh-huh. What's her podcast? Journey Forward with Jory Rose. What is it? I can can hook you up if you want. Will you? Um, I will. Of course. Um, So- um, but I was, I was driving, my daughter's 14 and we were driving to school the other day and she was talking about like Netflix shows that she's watched. And I was like, have you watched, I think the show is sex education on Netflix. I watched one episode and my is, husband was horrified. Yeah. 
So that's the one with the mom that's sex therapist and the son. And it's, I thought it was great. Well-written, well-acted. And she's like, oh yeah, I've, I've seen all two seasons. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, then you've learned a lot. Um, and I was like, do you have any other questions? (laughs) (laughs) So my talk here is done. So I said, if you, you know, I just did a, a podcast interview with a sex therapist uh, out of New York and, and a sex researcher. I said, so you can be just like the son on that show. Because I like to creep her out at times. Totally. It's, so, it's so much fun. You know, there's a saying that I've never met. It, well, let's see. It's um, a young mind is a terrible thing not to fuck up. <laughs> Shut up. That's not a real saying, is it? No, that's my saying. Okay, fine. I'll um, take it. And I normally, like, I, normally I say sense. screw up, yeah. you know, to clean it up, but I figured it's you, so it doesn't matter. Um. <laughs> for being a potty mouth. Right, but it's true. And, you know, like I told you, like every time my husband and I, like when I kid, my kids got curious, they would be like, you know, we could be fighting or like talking about something we don't want them to hear. And be like, um, mommy and daddy need a couple minutes to talk. Are you guys going to have sex? And so now every time we want to talk, we tell them we're having sex. And guess what? Sometimes we have sex. No, but oh, like, man. Yeah. Try it. I, yeah, I like it. I do too. But I also think there are certain things we shouldn't get used to. And that was the point of my bringing up this, this patient experience. And I, I have some major guilt because for six years I tried to steer her in a direction she wasn't ready to go. And, um, you know, and as it turned out, uh, about two years ago, this came up again he was acting weird. She had been away. And I was like, can I make an inappropriate therapist suggestion? She said, yes. Cause she'd stuck with me this long. I said, check your, check the credit cards. Mm. And we found the answer to our question. Um, so, um, she left him and is now engaged to a man who does want sex with her. Mm-hmm. And thank God, because at some point we have to get off our treadmills. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of it's about, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of my fiance that, you know, to, when she feels adored and desired and respected and loved, and there's that emotional connection, like her body responds. Yes. And there's physiological responses, kind of the Pavlovian responses that you were talking about. Oh, so you've come around to my Pavlovian behavioral therapy. Only slightly. I'll take it. Only slightly. Um, Cause like Skinner was a weirdo. Like, he was a freak. They were all weirdos. They were. But they I were heard, all I heard weirdos. Skinner, Let's not even get it to shocking people. Oh, I heard B.F. Skinner kept his youngest child in a box just to see like how that would affect him. I don't think that's true. I think that was a rat, but go on. It could have been a rumor. I don't know, but it's a good rumor. Um, I also, I'll, I'll I also spread heard, it. Pay also, me money and I'll spread it. I heard Freud liked having cocaine blown up his ass with a straw. So I actually was trained in, uh, my analytic training is Hornayan. And let me tell you something, Karen Hornay tells a lot of shit. So. Her last name's Horny? Hornay. Hornay. Okay, close. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so, St. Patrick's Day was rough around the so, wait, so going back to this whole idea of the hedonic treadmill of sex, so what suggestions do you have for us to keep from getting habituated to sex in our relationship? It's funny you ask that because I have just found a brilliant way to relate it back to Pavlov. Oh, your book. I know. Um, Ten steps so, to find me happy. Ten steps to find me. I had to throw the happy. title in there. Um, if you are listening to this and you are in the New York, Long Island, Nassau, Suffolk area, please come to my book launch on March 18th. Um, at the Cradle of Aviation Museum. It will be from 7 to 9 p.m. We will be giving away prizes because I want everyone to leave a little happier. Also, I will cry if no one shows up. Are there free drinks? Yes, there will be. See, that's a big selling point for me. I know, but you live too... Like, you, it would be cheaper for you to pay for drinks than to come. Also, John will probably be um, donating an autographed picture of himself or something... <laughs> For a raffle. Yes, shirtless photo. So I'm just going to go for like an Evolve Caveman merch. Sure. You guys, you heard it here. Oh, yes, perfect. I love it. Um, so an autographed coffee mug. <laughs> an autographed coffee mug. It's fine. I'm going to stamp a sticker on it that says 10 Steps to Finding Happy. And the recipient of it will post it on March 20th Very because nice. I am trying to... Um, 
I never thought I would work with suicidal teenagers, and yet this is where I am. And so I am trying to use this teensy tiny grassroots. Um, yeah, my co-host, my co-author likes to say, gosh, she created a fake publicity promo account and she had her niece record it. And then she had her niece use a different last name that wasn't um, ethnic because she didn't think, oh, fucking A. And I'm just like, we need help, grassroots movement. I want to raise awareness to destigmatize mental health. So, and all of the 10 steps in the book have been, they're backed by research. Like, um, I literally read her book, it was hers to begin with, and I was like, do you know we can back this shit up with real science? And she was not so interested, but I am forceful and opinionated, and so. Uh, and research-based. And research-based. Which I love about you. I know I love that about you, too. We love dorky out of science. <laughs> We're total geeks. So I, um, I did back up all those 10 steps with science. We also have 24 expert writers who will flesh that out for you. So even if you don't like me or my co-host, um, co-author, sorry, you will probably like one of them talking about how they found their happy through shitty situations or how they found, how they define their happy or um, any number of things. Like got a, a, a fantastic mom who was an art teacher and she finds her happy through doing art projects with her kids. So... And she's going to donate something to the raffle because I want everyone to leave happier. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So you were going to go into how we could, the hedonic treadmill of sex, how do we offset that using your 10 steps to happy? I still will. Did you think I forgot? Yes. Okay. I, did I was just trying to keep you on track. No, it's okay. I took my meds today. Okay, good. Vivans, take me away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have a better so, memory for these strings in the conversation than I do. Um, I think all of my life, you know, the, um, you'll know the Johnny Cash, no, who is it? The ring of fire. Oh yeah. Um, but social distortion, but you know, the thing where it's like, I hear you, but I'm like, it's a circle, but there's different spikes on it. Like, uh -huh. like right. So th that is how my brain works. And apparently no one ever thought that that was weird. They just thought it was easily distractible, but in fact, just ADD. So now I come back to it all the time. So uh, 10 steps of finding happy. Please, dear God, do not ask me to name all 10 steps because when I have been asked that, I have stumbled and hemmed and hawed and possibly made shit up. <laughs> you know what? Do, make a one pager that's got just the 10 steps on it. I did and then I lost it because I was distracted. <laughs> <It's ready -D. laughs> so um, listen, one of the biggest things is to try something new because... Ah, uh, Yes. Science, um, your uh, neurotransmitters, your neural connections, your synapses, they fire differently when you, fire, when you try something new. And it's almost like a byproduct accident that these, the firing of different neurotransmitters and connections leads your happy hormones to jump up and everyone gets excited. They're like, this is new, this is new. And even if we hate it, we're trying something new. Yeah. So getting back to the hedonic treadmill. Try novelty. Something so like, would that be like having sex in different rooms of the houses or the house on the stairs in public toys, different lingerie? <laughs> what, what would you suggest? I forgot it's video too. Yeah. Um, yes. I think that would be an idea. I think you should have sex in every room in your house. Uh, almost every room. Washing machine or dryer washing machine or dryer. I'm not sure which one is better. Um, but spice things up. Yeah. Uh, surprise your partner. Ask for them to surprise you. I also have always loved the idea of like, well, Valentine's Day just passed, but for whatever it is, anniversary or even just nothing, um, surprise them with, you know, like, like write a bunch of fantasies that you've had and put them in a, a box and every so often take something out and encourage your partner to, to do the same. This is trying new things. This is a way to be. Yeah. There's a, uh, I guess there's lists out there on the internet that are called yes, no, maybe lists that you can print out and you can both go through and it's a list of different sexual acts and you can say, yes, I'm open to this. No, uh, maybe I'm open to that. And then you can kind of compare and see where do you, where are you guys the same and what are you willing to try? That doesn't make it too scientific. I do think novelty, well, it's just, it's a conversation and then you can have it later. You can do the act later, but, um, 
I, I think novelty is a big piece of it. And I think also, you know, kind of the reminder for the men out there that the b- biggest sex organ in the woman is her brain. And so that means four plays all day long. So to send thoughtful texts or texts expressing your desire or leaving notes on the bathroom mirror saying, I want you, or I love you, or I think you're beautiful. All those are good ways to go as well. I think it's a tie between the brain and the clitoris, but since most men can't find that, we can go with brain. I can't get to the brain. Uh, It is difficult. I heard the clitoris was a myth. I've heard that too by men. Actually, someone (laughs) was saying that, someone was saying that, uh, the clitoris did not appear in scientific literature until the year 2000. Okay, just to remind you, um, for years, mental illness was thought to be caused by a wandering uterus or, um, uh, what was it? The oh, you mean hysteria? Underlying, un- unaligned, misaligned humors, which were invisible mm-hmm. things um, that looked like paint jars. Somewhere. Not demonic possession? That was a fantastic story and one of my favorites from the Salem Witch Trials, but a whole different conversation. Uh, okay. Yeah. And that was actually just a man not wanting to admit he was wrong and didn't know what was the, wrong. Isn't everything in science that way? I mean, I, like, I guess the no. clitoris wasn't studied because it's merely for pleasure, but there's more, I mean, the amount of nerve endings there is, I think it was 8,000. Um, there's more nerve endings there square per square inch than any place else in the female body. I have no idea how many inches of clitoris is. I, I, you know, less than six. <laughs> you, don't need, you don't know either. <laughs> this is just one of these facts you memorize. Um, about the length of your foot. It's about the length of your foot. Um, no, but you know, it's funny. In I have never read a self-help book. I never thought I would write a self-help book. This, you know, fell into my lap at a time when, you know, I have discussed our mutual um, back issues. I had mm. tried surfing because I'm a badass and then realized I'm not badass and I threw out my back. Mm. And um, my co author, Selene Castrovia, who has written books for years with varying success, uh, she sent me her book to read and I said, you know, there's science, and then expanded it as we discussed um but there is some truth to this like try something new in your sex life in your marriage in your actual life um my husband and i went to a paint night and we still argue over whose is better it's mine spoiler alert we um we do try to do new things with our kids and uh with varying success but i think that we place Sex is so stigmatized and in a positive way, which is important because my whole goal is to destigmatize mental health. <laughs> but um, plug 10 steps finding happy, hashtag 10 steps and the stigma. Um, but it is so stigmatized where shows like sex education or anything seduce us into thinking that we will, that sex should be a certain way, you know? And so here's the thing like it always pisses me off when people in movies have one night stands and the woman orgasms i'm like really really you're a man you're just nodding you don't see the no i i think that it's i mean i haven't had that many one night stands but it's not realistic in the sense that most women more than 10 or less than 20 more than more than 10 fine um, are we talking one night stands? Sorry, I was okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think it's realistic in the sense that most women aren't going to be able to fully relax into that experience and therefore are going to have a hard time reaching orgasm. Agreed. And I also think that it has to do with knowing your unless, part. Unless they're body. drunk, wasted. Yeah. And, and I think you're right. I think I'm sorry. If they're drunk, wasted, they're never going to have an orgasm. No, they're not more relaxed then. No, sweetie. Have okay. You- there's a term called, it starts with a W and then there's whiskey. Oh, whiskey, yeah. Did, really? Oh, gotcha. No. Yeah, but, I think that exists for women as well. Really? I mean, not to the same extent, but to the climax, yeah. Whiskey clit? Whiskey clit. We should hashtag that. I like that hashtag. <laughs> we should call this episode whiskey clit. Um, <laughs> no, but I think that we, I think that there are unrealistic expectations about what sexuality and sex should be for a woman. And so we 
it's so rare that women, one of the greatest things I do in my practice is if someone is sexually active with more than one person or even with their husband, I ask them about their orgasm. Do you have an orgasm? Is it from sex? Is it from oral sex? Is it from manual stimulation? Because I think- a vibrator, it, yeah. Yes, and because I, it's always going to be from a vibrator. Those mm-hmm. things are effective as fuck. But I think that it plays a part into your relationship and mm-hmm. what you're looking for in sex. If you're out there- Pouring it up. It sounded know. like a judgment. It, it, I know, but you know what I mean. Like, if you're out there having sex with a bunch of How many? Of more than 10, less than 20? I would say more than... T- it depends on your age. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, no. I I was the makeout queen. Mm-hmm. That was it. Made okay. out with everyone. Okay. M- made out with everyone, then... Fell asleep. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, uh, exactly. No <laughs> um, but you know, if you're out there whoring it up, the question is why. And if you're out there whoring it up and not getting sexual gratif- gratification from it, really, why? Yeah. Um, so that's why it's important to me. And if you're not happy in your marriage, I really want to know why you. Um, well, no, I don't need to know. I understand. Well, that. and I've ha- I have heard that millennial women um, are doing more of the one night stand thing because there's a dearth of marriage quality millennial men. That the the marriage rates for millennials are actually dropping for the first time in a long time. Uh, marriage rates are declining, and one of the big causes of that is there's a lot of millennial men that just aren't. Uh, they're not financially viable. So, I, and I know a lot of I, a young mean, I agree with that, but I don't think that accounts for. I think millennial women are, there's, listen, I'm, there's a lot of shit wrong with millennials, like entitlement and lack of ambition and lack of drive. But I will tell you that the women that I know that are millennials, patients, friends, acquaintances, when they want to have sex, they simply reach out and find someone to have sex. Exactly. Right? Whereas like my generation and yours, I'll include you, oh, thank are, you. Um, you know, it was more of a, I feel like I had to have feelings or believe I had feelings or feign feelings yeah. to get, to reach out to someone sexually. Well, I still think that way, right? I still think that the emotional connection is a big part of great sex. I do too. And that gets back to the trust issue. However, I want to see what this generation of, you know, millennials accomplished by simply being able to uh, ask for what they need in a way that men have been able to for years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to be more empowered. Maybe. I hope so. Um, I hope so because my daughter, my nine-year-old isn't a millennial right now. Yeah, and, and I hope that they don't just, I, I mean, I don't know. Well, it'll be interesting. It's kind of a great social experiment because um, hopefully they're not just disconnected. Um, I, I just see it and, you know, I'm sure there's exceptions, but it seems like there's a hookup culture out there for a certain age bracket. And I do think a lot of it is that a lot of the millennial men out there are having difficulty getting out of their parents' home. They're smoking a lot of weed. They're gaming. Yep, yep. They're I have so and many. <laughs> and it's, it's safer to stay at home and not risk anything than to face the fear and get out there and do something. I agree. Um, I have a lot of millennial patients who are looking for girlfriends and can't find them and they're not bad looking a lot of them are good looking guys and you know in theory they want a relationship but i don't know that they have the tools like uh there's a lot of other things missing you know like if you're still living in your parents home and you're 29 red flag Kind of a red flag. Um, And then again, I also advise a lot of my patients about their social media posts and particularly the, um, you know, Tinder, OkCupid, uh, online dating. I'm not against it, but be sure to give a part of who you are and also be sure to um, say what you're looking for, present the right image, you know. uh, Be honest. Oh, oh, maybe, but I was going with... (laughs) I'm on seeing on those on those profiles on the dating profiles like be honest like no, no. say we say we're looking for millennial men find a find an animal we love animals a dog a cat post with that oh 
get an animal or find an animal? Just take a picture of the goddamn animal. Hey, look, I found a wild wombat out in the garbage cans. I was thinking more a cat or a dog, but wombats could be cool too. Okay. Just not birds. Those scare the shit out of me. And snakes. Squirrel. Rat. Alive or dead? Here's the boa I caught outside. Then you will definitely find a certain um, niche group of people. But, you know, like, they don't know what to put. They don't know how to present themselves. And, like, ladies, uh, don't use a fucking filter that makes you look like a cat because I cannot tell you apart from anyone Uh, else. You know, the other thing that used to annoy me when I was doing online dating was women that would only put group photos on their profile. (laughs) So it's like, who the fuck are you? Which one are you? Are you Especially if, they're, if you're all brunettes or you're all blonde, I can't tell. And it's oh, it's so frustrating. I would just pass right over. Yeah. Is that how you met your fiancé? On Tinder. So see, we're pro-Tinder. Uh-huh. But I'm also pro you saying something. One of the best Tinder uh, profile things I ever saw was when one of my patients, we constructed it together because I rock. And it was like, um, Islanders, not Rangers. Um, dogs, not cats. So the greater must, sign? Yeah, like dogs greater than cats? Right. That kind of thing. Yeah, must, I those. must love potatoes. Potatoes. And she's now, she's a boyfriend. She Who doesn't is. love potatoes? Um, keto people. Uh. Just saying. Um, but yes, so we do need to find a way to break out of our box. We do need to find a way to communicate more. I'm trying to find a way to bring it back to my book so we can. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, 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 sorry. What was the book title again? For reals. Yeah. See, this is proof that men don't listen to women. No, I'm giving you the opportunity for another plug. Oh, I was trying so to help you out. I'm sorry. So tell me again what my book title is. What, what's the book title again? 10 Steps to Finding... <laughs> 10 Steps to Getting Laid? 10 Steps to Finding Happy. That's it. 10 Steps to Finding Happy. Um, you can already pre-order it on Amazon, which I'm sure John will link to. If Absolutely. I send it to. Um, and mostly I want to use, in all seriousness, I want to use this book launch to... Um, promote the hashtag 10 steps and the stigma. I work a lot with suicidal teens and I well-meaning parents try to advise their teens not to um, reveal this secret because it's so Mm -hmm. awful and that ends up in shame and isolation. And so I am using the, the book is great. It's going to find ways to make you happier. Mm -hmm. If you want to be happy, you have to take action. Here are things that will make you happier. They're actions, but still. Um, but really, I am trying to raise awareness about, you know, teen suicide prevention. And um, I just kind of want us all to come together and to start talking about the shit that doesn't feel okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the other part of it is take action. But I think you also need to believe. You need to believe that you can get out of the sadness. You need to believe that you can get a happier. You need to believe that some of these tools can help you because it's that whole mindset thing. And we know that mindset is incredibly powerful. And so I've had depressed clients that'll be like, you know, I'll teach them tool after tool after tool. And they're like, nope, won't work for me. Nope. Tried it. Nope. Nope. That won't work for me either. And it's like, if you shoot them down before you practice them, guess what? They're not going to work for you. Right. And if you don't believe, find someone who does. It's that growth mindset, right? It's that something can help me. I just need to find it and I need to practice it. I agree. Um, Gosh, I think maybe the reason all these, uh, you know, um, hallucinogenic drugs, ketamine, um, acid, et cetera, are being used is because perhaps we can try to brainwash people who have to not help. I thought you were saying you took some before the show. I always take some before. Are they just kicking in now? No, they kicked in like 20 minutes ago. You didn't Oh, thank God. (laughs) <laughs> it's all about timing. All right. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining me. So again, the book is 10 Steps to Finding Happy. The hashtag is 10 Steps to Ending the Stigma. Is that hashtag correct? 10 Steps and the Stigma. And you will be receiving a lot of these to pass out to all your cool friends. Oh, you should. Yeah. Send them to me. I will. And then you're going to hook me up with your fiance. I will. But not in a sexual way. I'm, I'm not feeling on a, a hedonic treadmill today. You're not polyamorous or bi. Not yet. Yeah. Just so everyone knows. <laughs> We have to be very clear about our expectations. All right, Lindsay, it's been a blast. Uh, We'll have to do it again sometime because this is just fun and funny. Agreed. And rarely do we get those opportunities. 
unless we make them for ourselves. That's right. So thank you very much. I hope I wish you all the best on the book launch and book sales, and we will definitely stay in touch. Thank you. And that is it for this episode of The Evolved Caveman. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 